This is Diane Andrews in black and white. The issues you don't want to talk about. The arts and entertainment you need to know. And now here's your host, Diane Andrews. Welcome to Diane Andrews in Black and White, and I'm your host, Diane Andrews. Thank you for viewing us all over the state of Louisiana and a part of Mississippi and our YouTube and Vimeo audience. And thanks for our audience out in the studio. I appreciate your viewership. Today we're going to talk about something called flesh-eating bacteria. I'm going to let Dr. Retard was teasing me. You all know Dr. Retard. He's the head epidemiologist for the state of Louisiana. We've done Zika together about uh, four months ago, and we have done Ebola last year. We're going to do just a little update on what's going on with those uh, two diseases also. But we're going to talk about flesh-eating bacteria. Pronounce it for me, necrotizing. Fasciatis. 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 Well, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Everybody <laughs> noticed that I have an accent? Yeah, so I may be right and you're wrong. Yeah, okay. maybe you're right. All right, all right, okay. Uh, so Dr. Retard, the reason I wanted to do this show, when we did um, Zika back in May, Dr. Retard, I didn't know he had had surgery and amputation. When I saw him wheel in to the studio, and I was in the middle of a show, so I couldn't say anything, but I was shocked. Back in March, you had told me you had, um, he's a diabetic, and you had a little sore on your foot. Yeah. And then when you wheeled in, it was obvious it was uh, above the knee amputation, what they call an AKA, no, above no, the knee, right? Oh, it's mid-knee, okay. Yeah, it you is. can see my knee. Oh, okay, there, I thought the other day when you were here, yeah. I didn't yeah, know if that was back. a prosthetic, because. It grew back. It, huh, it grew back, yeah, it grew back. <laughs> like a lizard. Right, you're, you're a lizard. You know, Dr. Retard is from near the uh, South Pacific. He's from the South Pacific. He's gone to the, uh, he's gone to school in Paris and New Orleans and all over. And again, he's our head epidemiologist specializing in tropical medicine, right, yeah. Dr. Retard? So, Dr. Retard, how did your a sore on your foot get so bad that you have to get an amputation? Well, there was a, in the, it, it was a crack in the heel and it was fairly deep, and I started putting uh, some antibiotic cream on top. It was uh, just from dry skin, a crack from dry skin? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it was cold, you know, it started uh, in the winter, uh -huh. and putting antibiotic on, uh, on it, and at first I didn't notice it, and it started growing inside, and I was busy, and didn't, uh, didn't do anything about it until it started really being uh, um, painful, mm -hmm. then I was busy for a week or two, postpone it and when I went to get medical attention it was too late. What was it hurting or did it turn a color because you had gangrene is what happened the yes. tissue is dying yes. with flesh-eating bacteria. The bacteria were you know going inside and it's it was a streptococci. Right. You know very common bacteria that you find. A group A strept just B. like strepto. A group like, B. Group B. There just like strep throat. Yes group A is the strep throat. Mm -hmm. Some of these strains they will have a toxin that digests your tissue digest the tissue that you have. It, so it's tissue and muscle, right? And skin. It at, will eat it the, all. At the end, everything uh, goes away. That's why you call it a flesh-eating bacteria. Mm -hmm. So w w my mistake was to be busy, not to pay attention, mm -hmm. not to go get. Uh, at that time, they should have cut it inside, right. open it, and uh, it would have been cured. Right. But I, I neglected it. Because the further you let it go, the more it's eating inside yes. of your body. And then uh, after a while, you can pump all the antibiotics you want. It's not going to do the job. Because the tissue is not coming back. Now, what I have read, and you're the expert, you have to have an open sore like you did. There's a young lady named Amy Copeland, and you'll see a picture of her on the screen. You may remember her three or four years ago. She was uh, zip, zip tiding or something. They call it over a river. And uh, she fell into the river. And she obviously, with the zip, had hurt her arms. And I don't know how her feet had to get amputated. She lost both arms and some of her feet, one on her foot. And now she has prosthetics. She uses, it, it was cut, amputated to here. She was only 19 or 20 years old. But if you go look Amy Copeland up, this is, she is the best attitude in the world. She's learning how to use uh, the, uh, 
They're hundred thousand yes. dollars a piece, and they gave them to her. This company, True Bionics, or something, gave them to her, and so now she has her dog that helps her. But this can be very serious. Seven hundred and fifty people get it a year. I understand. Yeah, and uh, you have people that have some special types of meningitis. I saw, and sometime you get a, a severe infection, not from a wound, you know, another, uh, and you start losing uh, the arms, the legs. A lot of people get them in the hospital too, don't they? Flesh-eating bacteria? I've heard some people who got it in the hospital. You can get it in the hospital, but you know you can get it on the streets so, or. Um, but it has to be an open in the skin, a tear. Is uh, that correct? Sometimes you get also you are not lucky, and one of these bacteria that uh, is going to come through your nose, through your uh, uh, through your throat, something like that. Uh, not long ago, there was somebody with meningitis, meningococcal meningitis, that you don't get from a wound. Right. You get it from uh, getting it from the air, uh -huh. uh, close to someone else that's a carrier, and mm -hmm. the, their immune system allowed it to start multiplying, mm -hmm. and it went very fast. And there was another, there was a, uh, an example of somebody that lost the two legs. Both legs. Yes. Because you have to stop it. My mother was in the hospital, and before she passed, she ended up, she was a diabetic, and got a wound on her heel, as you, in the hospital. And it started, I actually saw it start turning green. And she had to get, because uh, the flow had stopped at the knee. Yes. So she had to, to get the above the knee uh, amputation. Yes. And you could actually see the flesh turn green. And we're going to show you a picture on the screen of uh, what gangrene looks like and that's yes. just that's what it is gangrene and gangrene you you can use that word right for, because uh, it looks green it, it yes. the skin actually looks purple and green and basically the skin is dead i'm not sure that it's it, uh, with the word green but yeah it looked green it looked darker than her other yes. parts of her body and it had a greenish tone yeah, it was dead sometimes it's black sometimes it's black okay it turns black like the the dead uh, tissue uh-huh because yeah. there's nothing there but dead tissue yeah and it, it was just amazing to me how to see and uh, somebody how the human body can turn into something that just looks like you should throw it away. You know, they, uh, they did throw away my Yeah, they, did, they and they threw away. When they amputate, they just take it and throw it away, I understand, right? When I they, think they, they, they burned it. Burned, right. And it's in the dust. Mm -hmm. And somebody has been breathing my foot. Can you get anything from gangrene, breathing gangrene, no. in the, when they burn it, Dr. Atat? <laughs> no, once it's burned, it's, it's just a dust. Okay, it's not like uh, Ebola or something, right? Uh, how you have to burn Ebola, use chlorine. That's yeah, whenever you burn something, it goes away. You know, I was surprised that it wasn't more than 750 incidents of amputations or something of people with uh, flesh-eating bacteria. Because a lot of people have wounds from diabetes that in tend Louis to have to have amputations. In Louisiana, the flesh-eating bacteria is about uh, 100 in 2014. 100 uh, cases? Yes. In Louisiana? So I think that maybe what I read when it said 750 cases, maybe must be more. Uh, must be, it's got to be more. But yeah. people don't usually die from it, I read. Is that correct? Or do no, they no, die? Yeah, 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 you can die from it. Because it spreads all the way up your body? Yes. To the organs? Because yes. it will, right? If you don't stop it, it's going all the way up your body. Yeah. And it's going to last a long time. And if you are not uh, lucky, you don't know what, what's going on. One of these bacteria gets into the blood, multiplies in the blood. Uh, that can be stopped with antibiotics, but you have Did to it hurt? Were you feeling pain? Was that a sign? Yes, what are symptoms of, of the gangrene setting in? Uh, my main symptoms were that it was hurting like hell. And, and you did nothing, Dr. Retard. You know the doctor is always the bad patient. Yeah. Yeah. And as soon as they cut off my foot, no pain. The, the pain was gone. It was radical. Well, the thing causing the pain was eliminated, yeah. right? And then this foot is not painful. <laughs> I know it's not. Yeah. Yes. But now, when you get a prosthetic, which is what you have on, sometimes the connection it fits well and no pain when it up here. How long have you had it now? Because you didn't have it in May. The the prosthetic. Uh, when I came, I was in the wheelchair, so right. I was waiting. You have to wait until the stump heals. It's completely healed, right? And the skin get a little bit thicker, because if not, it's going to rub. Right. And then you you have small Irritation. sores that right. can be infected. So how long so does it take a stump to heal usually? It, it depends. Some people are going to heal very fast. And you're Some diabetic people, too, yeah. So it's going to be slower. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to be very careful and slowly um, 
when you have a prosthetic slowly, put it uh, longer and longer to get, make sure it's well healed. Mm -hmm. So you have no problem now? No. With any pain? It's, uh, well, I'm happy uh, to hear it because I was worried about you, Dr. Or, or Todd. Um, let's talk a little bit. I just wanted to give people an update on Zika. Ebola, I understand it's no more from the World Health Organization, no more Ebola crisis in the world. Is no, that not what you're a hearing? crisis. I'm sure, you know, Ebola is still in some uh, bats and things right. like that. And once in a while, somebody is going to come up with Ebola. Probably now people are going to pay attention mm -hmm. and not ignore it. Ebola is not a disease that's going to flare up. Well, we already. talked about that in our first show. Don't yeah. worry about Ebola. Now, Zika is a little bit different case, right? In America now, we have over 3,300 cases. I think about 29 have been in Louisiana. 32, New I think. Yeah, yeah, 32 now. Like. Uh, and California has a lot. New York, yes. because a lot of people are going back and forth from uh, yeah, Brazil. Yeah, lots of imported cases, mm -hmm. yes. But locally, locally grown or locally obtained, none have been in Louisiana. So far, no. But Florida, I think, has had some local yes. obtained cases. Yes. I guess it was sexually transmitted. Do you know how those were? No, by mosquitoes. By mosquitoes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the big difference between West Nile, that's in the bird and it's mm -hmm. everywhere, mm -hmm. and uh, Zika, Dengue, Chikungunya, right. is that it has to be imported by people. Imported by people. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so if one person comes, you know, a mosquito would have to buy that one person. Right. When you have 100 people that are infected that come, you have more chances right. of getting it to spread. So it's not surprising that uh, South Florida, where you have a lot of people from the Caribbean, right. from Latin America coming. Right. So a lot of people are coming and then um, the virus is in the blood only about seven days, one week. Mm -hmm. So if you started getting infected, outside in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. three, four days, then you come here, you have three days the virus in the blood. Now what are the symptoms, like a cold? Uh, the symptom, it's a fever, a little, little bit fever. like the flu. Mm -hmm. The fever, a conjunctivitis, a mild the rash, eye. Yeah. and then pain in the joints. Mm -hmm. And to be ready for Zika. But I understand only about 20% of people who have Zika get sick. Is that a correct number? Some yes. people have it and it yes. does nothing to them. It depends a little bit on the different outbreaks, but 20, 30 percent, yeah. uh, even more, can have no symptoms at oh. all and some have And uh, now could symptoms. I transmit it? I have it with no symptoms. Could I give it sexually to somebody else? Yes, even if I have no symptoms? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, it's it definitely like sexually transmitted. Yes. We're learning more about right. that because it's fairly rare. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else new that has happened since we last did the show in May on Zika? You have to be Zika ready. And uh, I'm going to give you that. So oh, you thank are Zika you. Ready. Thank you. So I can swap the mosquito. And now, if you swap any mosquito that comes close to you, right. you have it made. Now this is, and we'll put it on the screen, the ADS Egypti, which we saw, we, we had him on the last show. That's the mosquito that causes uh, Zika and also the other one, Da Nang, doesn't it? The same mosquito? Is it the same or not the same that causes IGT it? is good for a yellow fever, mm -hmm. but we don't have that here and right. very little in the world. Um, yellow fever, dengue, um, dengue, yeah. Zika, and chikungunya. And remember, Zika started in the Zika forest in, in uh, Uganda, Africa. So I would tell people just, I've read that if you eat garlic, and I did go to Rio since uh, the last show. I had to pick my nephew up and we were doing some charity work over there. And I ate garlic every day when I was there and before you I went. You were afraid of the zombies or the... No. <laughs> no. But when I ate it, nothing came around me. They said they don't like the scent. Ah. And I put Zika at the bed. <laughs> you see, with that and uh, the garlic, you are... You are right, safe. I'm good. Get you some garlic. Garlic kills everything. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, a lot of... Remember, the deadliest animal in the world is the mosquito. It's hard to believe, but the yes. t one of the smallest is the most deadly because yes. malaria is still very prevalent in, in underdeveloped de countries and things, yes. right? So do you expect, did they create a vaccine for Zika and Ebola? Do they have one? They're working on both. Both, because Ebola, they were creating a vaccine. Yes. And that was two years ago, and they still don't have it ready. If it happens again, it's another outbreak. It's making some progress. Mm -hmm. And for Zika, they, they're trying to develop a vaccine. Yeah. There, there is already a vaccine for dengue. Not very useful because every case are imported. But now, some countries would be useful. Malaria has a vaccine too, doesn't it? No. A pill you take when you get ready to go yeah, over there. Yeah. yeah. 
the, they did, they're trying to work on a vaccine for malaria, but nothing that works very well. Why is it the, the DNA chain changes um, in the mosquito, that mosquito, or what? The parasites, mm -hmm. the parasites are very smart, mm. and they know how to hide from your immune system. It's like cancer. Yeah, they hide a little mm -hmm. bit. They're hiding. Well, everybody, we just wanted to give you a health update on some of the tropical diseases that are also here in America. So when you travel, just be very safe and be very careful. Thank you, Dr. Rattad, for coming all the way from New Orleans. Thank you. Okay. Order your copies now of Diane Andrews' latest books, Third Man Out, a suspenseful mystery by Diane Andrews, and Gumbo for the Heart, 25 stories of faith, hope, and charity, both available now on Amazon.com. Welcome back to Diane Andrews in Black and White. We are hearing a lot of new things going on with drones. We use them in uh, agriculture. We use them. Our government is using a lot of drones, and, they, and they're acting like this is an okay way to do it. But we're going to tell you a few things about drones. Uh, they still are killing a lot of people with drones and wrongfully killing a lot of people using drones. I have Dr. Charles Malvo here with me. Thanks, for, thanks for joining thanks, me, Diane. Dr. Malvo. He yep. owns Environmental Robotics Institute. Mm -hmm. And he's going to tell us exactly what that is, but he's an expert on drones, um, all different kinds of drones and what they're using them for. He is a PhD in engineering. He went to LSU after he's from Lake Charles and after he was a policeman. And I think I'm That's going right. to have him on one of my Black, White, and Blue Lives Matter shows also. Mm -hmm. So tell us about drones. What made you go back to school? Your PhD is in engineering. Yes. How did you get into environmental robotics with your, dr your drones? Well, I thought about using technology to help people and what, what some of the ways that we could use robotic technology to make a difference in the world. Obviously, as you mentioned, drones are used in warfare. They yeah. do have a lot of military applications. Now, they're a lot bigger than what you use. They're, they're like those, airplanes. Those would be normally very large machines. Mm -hmm. Some of them are helicopter versions, but mm -hmm. some mostly are fixed wing aircraft. Um, and so I wanted to look in ways that we could use that same... Just to clarify to our mm -hmm. audience, which, but the drone has no pilot. I don't care how big it is. It's pilotless. operated out of, yeah, pilotless. That's the key, some right? Are, some are totally autonomous, <laughs> right. some are semi-autonomous, and some are remotely piloted vehicles, meaning that there is an operator somewhere on the ground. Right. If you saw the movie, which is probably taken off of the true story, Eye in the Sky with Ethan Hawke and mm -hmm. Helen Moran, it shows how they kill people wrongly because they're sitting there at the computer and they they may want this quote terrorist what we call terrorist mm -hmm. and but a little kid when that instance before he hits that button may have walked in there and they wrongfully killed the kid also that was some of the examples in that movie well, certainly I, I'm sure there would be it would be hard to know exactly what's right. going to happen when you're you can't miles stop it away. once you hit that button right it's gone once you once you hit the button yeah I'm sure it's, it's gone and that's the thing about robotic technology when you have a system that's autonomous or semi-autonomous once you send that on a mission, you, you have to be able to control it or call it back in mm -hmm. some way. And so there are some fail-safes mm -hmm. on, on, on military drones as well as commercial drones. Mm -hmm. And some of those fail-safes would include things like a return to home feature. Okay. So let's say if you're, if you're operating a drone in an area and you see something that you weren't planning to be there, like there's a vehicle that pulls in and maybe the drone was going to land there, mm -hmm. or there's right. an aircraft that you weren't expecting to be in the area, you can literally push a button on the remote or on your computer and bring the drone back to right, right where it was or make it land right then and there. Okay, and can you blow it up in the air if you want to or Can't just make it that, land? But you, can, you don't want to do that because how much do they the cost? You can power and make it land. A military um, one, an average of how much would a drone the cost? The average drone that the military's flying, if it's a small craft, you're looking at maybe fifty to $60,000. The, oh, okay. the larger units, over a million dollars. So what do you think of drone warfare versus people warfare? Well, the drone itself can be seen as a force multiplier because you could have one pilot on the ground that might be controlling mm -hmm. five to ten drones. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, of course, it also takes people off the battlefield mm -hmm. that otherwise would be in danger of becoming a casualty or becoming captured. So in that way, it, it can benefit. It has a benefit in military operations. The only other thing about it is it also, some would argue, takes away the cost-benefit analysis that mm -hmm. a live pilot might take mm -hmm. when a live pilot would consider whether or not he wants to fly over a city. Right. Because a drone pilot, you might argue, has nothing to lose in taking a risk and flying over a city 
and conducting an operation. And to me, it was amazing. They call them pilots. That was part of Ethan Hawke's problem in here. He wanted to get back mm -hmm. in a real plane. You know, most pilots are uh, are probably junkies for you know getting out there, risk takers and things mm -hmm. like that. So they're sitting behind a desk or in this room, mm -hmm. like we we're in a room, and they had all these different guys calling them drone pilots. Yeah, I do think that drones themselves has opened up the doors to a lot of people that maybe didn't want to become licensed pilots and fly full-size aircraft to actually mm -hmm. didn't want to be in the plane and allowed them to fly. But then also experienced pilots like myself who do fly full-size aircraft, because mm -hmm. I'm also a licensed pilot, right. uh, enjoy drones because it gives us an, another another avenue for us mm -hmm. to work on our skills and uh, express our skills as pilots. So when you're drone, when you're operating your drones, and you said you use some in agriculture, mm -hmm. and what else do you do? Agricultural applications, environmental applications, also research. Uh, there's also some places to be involved with things like infrastructure inspection. Mm -hmm. I recently did a presentation at the Louisiana Transportation Research Center's conference in Baton Rouge mm -hmm. on using drones to inspect bridges. This is a whole new world, a whole new opportunity for people to get into, isn't it? It's like a new industry almost, an in infancy, isn't it, Dr. Exactly. Marvel? Drones are just a small part of the Internet of Things, networked, integrated sensor systems that are ubiquitous and all mm -hmm. over. So the drone, what it does is it, it, it's, it's an, it, range, it extends the range of human senses. It mm -hmm. lets us see things that we otherwise couldn't see. For example... Well, what we're going to do also, just so you know, we're going to put some of your pictures on the show uh, that you mm -hmm. took during the flood. Oh, great. Uh, maybe a little of your video tapes. Yes. Yeah. So what it does is it, it gives people access to areas where they couldn't reach normally. Like, for example, for bridge inspection. Mm -hmm. The only way to inspect the bridge going across the Mississippi River in Baton Rouge would be to take a large boat, mm -hmm. to have some type of scaffolding, and actually to go up the side a of the bridge A human being going up the side, it. right? Yeah. But now with these robots, we can fly it out, yeah. take high-resolution imagery. We can also carry other types of scanners, and we can look at any possible cracks or damage on the bridge before it becomes a problem. It's almost like when you see that little, I started to order one, it's a robot that will uh, vacuum your room for you, a but put them, in the, put them in the air, take those, because they're yeah. all robots. Yeah, this is Like in plants are using robot. a lot of robotics in, in the plants mm -hmm. to build things. Yeah, there's automated plant process technology, mm -hmm. there's, there's automated control systems already, and these type of robots, these flying robots, are just an extension of that. But what do you think that's doing when you take away jobs? We already don't have many jobs in manufacturing, mm -hmm. and of course the cost benefit is with the robotic, mm -hmm. uh, not with the human being. What do you think, what do you see that doing to, to the human workforce over time in plants, which we don't have much manufacturing left in America anyway? Well, in, in chemical plants, drones can be very useful for flare and stack inspection. Mm -hmm. And what it can do is it can, you can use it to inspect things that otherwise you'd have to shut the entire plant down to get to. Mm -hmm. For example, if there's a smokestack or a flare stack in a plant, mm -hmm. the only way that you can safely inspect that with a human being is to cut that stack off meaning that you have to shut that section of the plant down, mm -hmm. and that means maybe two, three, four of weeks cost. off for all those workers, yeah. plus cost of the plant. Right. The drone opens it up to where you can actually fly the drone up there with the flare still running, with the stack still working, complete your inspection, and move on, and nobody has to stop working. How the big is this industry, the drone industry? The drone industry is predicted to be an $80 billion industry by 2020. Mm -hmm. Over 60% of that's going to be agriculture. And you are involved in agriculture, so briefly mm -hmm. tell us what you're doing in agriculture. Well, in agriculture, I'm using drones to look at farm fields, and I'm working on algorithms right now to be able to predict crop yield, and also looking at things like crop stress, irrigation, land use, and elevation. You hear all these things about farming now. I, I've heard, uh, the, I was on a radio show with the Black Farmers Association, mm -hmm. how they're being treated. And then I heard a white farmer on uh, television the other day saying that, that this administration is doing, farmers aren't getting their, uh, uh, the, I guess they used to get monies to mm. help them with the farming. Has mm. that been cut or are you involved in it in that manner? I'm not involved in that, in that manner. I know that, like everyone else, that the economy in Louisiana was an issue last mm. spring, especially mm. with the oil prices being down and right. the fact that a lot of our revenue comes from the oil industry. So I'm sure that has to be touching agriculture in some way and maybe that's what the farmers are talking about. But what growth do you see? Because we, we're still, aren't we importing uh, a lot of our fruit and everything from, just like manufacturing is being done mm -hmm. outside America, aren't we growing and bringing in fruits and vegetables, maybe not vegetables, I mean, maybe, but mm -hmm. from other countries also? I do know that we are importing quite a bit. Yeah. The thing about agriculture and drones is 
that you want to become more efficient. Mm -hmm. The drone is a tool that can help make agriculture more efficient. Mm -hmm. The important thing to remember is that we're making more people, but we're not making any more land. We're making so, more people. Oh, okay. Of course, yeah, well, of course okay. the human population <laughs> right, is increasing, growing, yeah. always, always growing. Right. We're looking for more sources of food. The only way to do that is through precision agriculture. Mm -hmm. And using a drone to do remote sensing on a farm and increase the efficiency of that farm and bring about robotic farming is going to be one way that we can feed the world. So how were you re received at when you spoke to, the, to people? Have mm -hmm. you spoken to farmers about what drones can do for them? Local farmers and grower associations have been very supportive of the mm -hmm. technology. They see it as just another way to increase yields, mm -hmm. and that's what, they're, that's what they're hoping for. The main concern that farmers and growers associations have is the bottom line. Can you increase yields for us? Can you make farming more sustainable? Can you make it to where we can cost feed an effective increasing also, population right? in a cost-effective way? Yeah. Yes. And you think we can with drones? Sounds like it. I think we can. Drones are just a part of it, but that's a very important part because we need to have a sensor network that can take a whole farm approach. Right now, the old technology is for people to go out on four-wheelers or to go out just on foot mm -hmm. and take representative samples at certain parts of the farm. And then you take those samples and from that you make predictions about fertilizer application, mm -hmm. about pesticide application, and about irrigation. Mm -hmm. But with the drone, we can fly over the entire farm, we can take that data, put it into a computer system, and then make analysis and make a whole farm approach to agriculture. When you got your PhD, did you know you were going into robotics and engineering when you got it? In, is this what you always wanted to do? Or by some haphazard chance you got into this field that is so exciting and growing? It's something I always wanted to do, and I saw that robotics was a way that I could help people. Yeah. And, it, and even though the irony of it is, the thing that you pointed out, that these can be weapons of war. Yeah. But at the same time, they can be weapons of peace right. that we can use it's to a save balance. lives. Yeah, it's yeah. a balance, like everything. Thank yeah. you very much, Dr. Charles Malvo. I think with you uh, helping out the country, the farmers, mm -hmm. that we'll get more efficient with what we're doing using drones. Thank you very much for being Thank here today. Thank you, Diane. You all see you next week, Diane Andrews in black and white. I saw this as a little girl growing up in a little town, Marouge, Louisiana. And uh, they said if everyone lit just one little candle, what a bright world this would be. You can imagine the illumination. And what that's not, it's not just the light of the candle. It's about opening your heart. It's about helping other people. Because the more you help, the more you give. I tell people all the time, I'm Donald Trump. I pay for the show. <laughs> so that, this is my give back uh, to the world to try to help. Because there's so, I've done, in 20 months, I've interviewed over 400 people. Mm -hmm. and I, I got a real job. And, this is, and I do it all my, I produce it, I get the people, I do everything. As you all know, bugging you. But, uh, but if you don't give back and, and try to fix what you think is, is a problem or what you know is a problem, what you see is a problem in the world, because it's going to make you a better person. My show has made me a better person. So goodbye and see you next week for some great show on Diane Andrews in black and white.